Hi. And welcome to the IT Google Hangout. I'm Joe Gaylord. I'm part of the team here at the, at the Young Innovators Competition. And I'm really thrilled to welcome you to uh, this Google Hangout, which is uh, uh, an activity that we do to have some uh, really interesting issues related to technology and business uh, today. And uh, today we're really happy to have uh, two of our current participants, Adam and Malala, on the call, along with uh, Brian, who is uh, Brian Quinn, the head of the director of Intel Labs for the European Network and Ecosystem. Uh, we have Fatima Kebe, who is one of our winners from the 2014 competition, and we have Ines Naper, who is the uh, project manager over at the Port at CERN, which is an interdisciplinary hackathon. Today we're going to be talking about making and the future of technology, uh, which is going to be covering topics related to prototyping new devices and how you bring them to the market and how you use uh, the power of uh, this, this maker movement and this, the, all of these uh, available uh, technologies for rapid prototyping in order to uh, make the, the technologies of tomorrow. Um, I'll get into an introduction of all of the, the panelists and everybody in a minute, but I just want to kind of give those of you who don't know a quick recap about uh, what our, our competition is. So uh, the Young Innovators Competition was founded five years ago. It's a project by the ITU Telecom World event which is an annual event that uh, seeks to bring together all the different uh, levels of the tech ecosystem, running all the way from um, uh, startups. And entrepreneurs through big everyone together in order to uh, discuss the future of technology. The Young Innovators Competition within that seeks out young people between the ages of 18 and 30 who have ideas about how uh, to start new businesses that will show tech uh, changing the world for the better. Uh, and we run a series of competitions throughout the year, and each one is themed around a different development issue or a different technology. Uh, right now, we are in the middle of a challenge that is in partnership with Intel on the use of single board devices. You can find out all about our competition at ideas.itu.int and uh, apply to possibly join us in uh, Budapest, Hungary for this year's ITU Telecom World this October. Um, when you on-site in Budapest, uh, we'll be giving uh, kind of initial business classes and, and some development training for our uh, young people, along with a chance to pitch your idea in front of global leaders. And uh, we'll follow up with a year of support coming from the ITU as a whole. So um, we're really hoping that you'll be able to join us uh, for, for this uh, challenge. And uh, I will get going with our call uh, presently. So um, I guess we'll start with uh, Adam, who is one of our current participants on this uh, call, Adam Poland. Adam, you want to introduce yourself? Hello. Hi. Sorry. Hello. Adam? Yes, yes. Uh, it's my turn, yes. I should start. Go ahead, give you an introduction of your project and, and why you're here. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon. My name is Adam Filipionek. I am the representative of a project Icebridge. Icebridge means in case of emergency. Uh, so, Icebridge is a company with a goal to develop implement and run an application called LifeBridge, which will considerably shorten the first aid time response, uh, delay in case of accidents and life-threatening situations, uh, where an underqualified individual may perform basic life-saving activities uh, before a professional emergency response team arrives. Therefore, our application is not a substitution, but an additional project 
which helps professional uh, to provide first aid. So it starts like this. Uh, you, you have a question when there is an accident. The person responsible uh, who, who calls anyone gets to the dispatcher and the dispatcher instead, uh, uh, but, I mean, uh, calls of course the emergency crew but also uh, gives a no notification to a people who are nearby the person who is injured and provide uh, and, and may provide first aid. So these people have a smartphone and have a in, uh, installed application, uh, life-saving application, and the dispatcher by geolocalization module searches for a people who can provide first aid. Just to let you know, for example, 200 meters from me there is an accident. I receive a SMS or uh, information, a message that somebody needs help. I agree to take this mission and thanks to a uh, map binding uh, map binding information I go on the place where the person is injured and provide first aid in this first minutes and thanks to this solution we might save people lives. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Adam, for, for that, that description of your uh, uh, project. Um, it's, it's really exciting. Actually, it's uh, an interesting note that I brought up with Adam. This is uh, the first time that we've done one of these calls with people who have, who have all applied multiple times to our challenges. Uh, Adam has actually been uh, uh, applied a couple of times uh, with the, the Ice Bridge and Life Bridge uh, project, um, and we always have found it a very exciting uh, uh, project, and, and we're really happy to be able to highlight him as someone that, that's applied a couple of times. And uh, actually, our, our other guest, Malala Khan, who is coming in from Pakistan, has a, a similar history with us. She's applied a couple of times to the, the Young Innovators Competition, and we're really happy to, to be able to highlight her work and, and uh, have her on the call. Uh, Malala, you want to give us an introduction to uh, what you do? Uh, yes, thanks, Joe. So persistence does pay off, it seems. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Malala Khan, and I am a electric an electrical engineering student from Pakistan. I'm also the co-founder and um, uh, CEO of Girl Tech. Um, so basically, Girl Tech is based on the idea that uh, there's a huge gap in technology for women. Basically, turning existing technology pink does not cater to technological needs of women. Um, Girl Tech makes gadgets, plans to make ga gadgets, apps, electronic devices, and security protection systems for women. The aim is to help women in situations where they feel threatened and to cater to social and technological needs specific to them. Um, future services would include products on the online shop, special customization and services according to customer needs and cultural social limitations. and we hope that products would uh, cover a wide range of medical, social, and security needs of women. Uh, a product which is under development is called CrowdSafe. Um, basically, it's a safety system, uh, a wearable, uh, which will also hook up to your smartphone and provide immediate um, response when the user feels in danger and presses a trigger. Uh, the response would include but is not limited to informing local authorities, saving location and recorded information on the cloud, sending location information to friends, and also uh, creating like a, a crowdsourcing help by sending alerts to people using the application within a certain radius. Uh, we hope that using single board technology uh, will be able to make um, the hardware portion more, much more smarter so that it connects to wireless itself so that if, if your smartphone isn't working it can be a major source of help by itself as well and in case that you don't have Wi-Fi it uses Bluetooth to connect to your smartphone and use uh, the resources of the smartphone. Um, we also have another product under development which is called um, basically it's more of a health system. I'm still looking for a name. Uh, <laughs> 
but basically it's about using a novel system of apps and gadgets to ena enable diagnosis and treatment, especially for women in far-flung areas, especially women in developing areas where um, issues like uh, related to sexuality and pregnancy are taboo. So um, that's also another area that we're working on right now. All right, how is my sound now? Is it fixed? Okay, fantastic. Sorry about that, little technical glitch. Uh, so one of the people that we've had the chance to work with in the past, who we've uh, uh, successfully gotten to highlight a lot of the work that she's done quite a bit this year has been Fatima Akebe, uh, who is uh, one of our participants on the call and one of our winners from the 2014 Young Innovators Competition. Uh, she won for our challenge on the Internet of Things. So Fatimata, you want to uh, give us an introduction of what your project was and, and uh, what you've been doing since? Fatimata, you've got to unmute yourself. Thank you. Okay. So as said uh, Joe, so I won the challenge about Internet of Things last year. So my project's name is Connected Echo, and it's a social mobile farming solution that takes advantage of existing Internet of Things technologies. And I wanted to make that technologies available to the developed world. So currently, I'm working in Mali, a West African country, where I'm trying to, um, to, uh, to fit the technology with the needs of the local people. And I'm especially working with uh, the cooperative of uh, women, because I think that uh, the, the women must be uh, included in the, how can I say, in the advancement of uh, the, the developing countries. So the technology we use is a sensor, uh, it's a solar powered sensors. So they uh, send to your mobile some information about your soil, such as the humidity. But the main information is uh, if your soil need, uh, needs to be irrigated, needs to be irrigated. And we have also a system of irrigation that will um, irrigate your soil in a um, specific quantity to avoid um, water shortages. And as I said, uh, uh, Fatimata has been uh, someone that we've really gotten a chance to talk about her work quite a bit. Um, and she was highlighted earlier this year uh, as what part of the ITU 150 celebration, uh, which I, I needed to mention that uh, I, this is the 150th year that the, the ITU has been in operation. We uh, started in 18 the uh, International Telegraph, a wide range of technologies. Um, and one of the partners that we work with on, on uh, these uh, things like the Internet of Things and, and uh, developing new technology and devices, uh, we have worked a bit with the port at CERN which uh, Inez uh, is one of the, the leaders there, and uh, I would like to have her talk a little bit about her work. Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Inez, and I'm working as a project manager 
for an association called the Port at CERN. Um, the Port fosters uh, need-driven innovation in the humanitarian field, which means that we are directly working with field experts who propose challenges uh, for our um, hackathons, as we call it, workshops. And in our projects, we are combining uh, creative minds um, from CERN, from UN, and other NGOs to work on uh, in, in interdisciplinary teams to work on topics that are beneficial to society. Um, last year, we had topics, for example, to improve um, the search of demining dogs and to help them to find landmines uh, even faster. And, for example, we also looked into applications, how to build an inflatable low-cost fridge that is easy to transport for um, medication um, cooling in the field. Um, this year's topic that um, we, are, have, we have chosen for uh, our hackathon, which takes place from the 2nd to the 4th of October in Geneva at CERN and at Campus Biotech. Um, we have uh, identified some challenges around big humanitarian data visualization, as well as um, a robust solution for airdrop bags for food drops, and as well as a new design of a baby incubator for difficult situations, e.g. during um, power shortages and so on and so forth. And we're really happy to, to be able to have a, uh, an ongoing connection with the port. We were able to invite some of the, the participants um, to a couple of our events last year. Uh, we had a, a speaker from the port able to talk about the co-creation process and, and those kinds of things uh, at uh, Telecom World last year. And uh, we're, we're really happy, especially because they are right around the corner, so we're able to, to really maintain a great relationship between us and, and the port, and we're really happy to have Inez on the call. Uh, speaking of great relationships, uh, we also have, uh, last but not least, Brian Quinn, who is the, the head of Intel Labs uh, European Network and Ecosystem. And uh, Intel is our partner on the Single Board Challenge, and uh, uh, we're really happy to, to have Brian able to speak about uh, developing some of the, the tech technologies that he works with at the Intel Labs. So, Brian, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Joe. And hello, everybody. Um, did I be right to you? It's great to hear some of the earlier speakers, Adam and Matala and Fatuma, that the persistence of entrepreneurs and innovators is very, very important. You'll not always get your goal achieved at first attempt, but to try and try again is, is so, so important. I think also to think about the ref is really inspiring. Um, Intel. Intel is a, you know, a global player in a technology front. We have many technology products. Uh, we have the Galileo board and the Edison board in the IoT space, and these are the boards that we are utilizing in the single board competition. But we're smart enough to know that our products are only as good as the really smart people who innovate on them, and people like you on the bridge, and we're really enthusiastic to have you come forward with your good ideas, and we're determined to support the winners from a technical level, but not only from a technical level, but also from an entrepreneurial, uh, go-to-market, productization perspective, because we know that very often that is the most difficult part in getting an idea all the way through to fruition. It's the productization, it's the go-to-market, it's the business models, and uh, we're, we're here and willing to help in all those stages of innovation for, for the entrepreneurs that are involved. Sorry about that. I experienced a slight lag on uh, 
my computer. Sorry about that. I experienced a slight lag on my computer. So um, thank you to everyone who's here. As, as we kind of just uh, uh, got to understand from our, our introductions, we're, we've got a really excellent group uh, together to talk about these big issues. And uh, for those of you watching, um, if you have an interest in asking any questions or, or uh, bringing up any topics that you would like us to discuss, please feel free. We've got the, the Q&A feature going live on our call. And then um, we also have the uh, option for you to, in, to ask your questions uh, via Twitter on hashtag ITU world and uh, feel free to, to let us know what you want to hear from us and, and what you're interested by and uh, hopefully we can give you some insights and, and help you to, to get some answers to your questions. Uh, speaking of questions, uh, let's get going. Um, Malala, I think you had the, the first question on our, our list. Um, yes, so my first question is what steps do you think are essential uh, in going from an idea to a working prototype? The, the switch going on that? Okay. So, um, Brian, do you have some initial uh, thoughts on this? D definitely, Joe, and I think, uh, Malala, I think the first thing I would say about um, an idea is to very much think about your idea unencumbered by how you might implement it. That's the first thing. I think too often people uh, restrict their creativity by thinking, oh, how could I do that? Or what are the difficulties? So, so the first thing is to be as unencumbered as possible in your thinking. Think big and think really creatively. Then, as you move towards prototype, because obviously you've got to be practical and ultimately try and get something that works. Um, again, try and build something that's that's a, an abstract of what you want to do. You know, don't necessarily go straight to the technology. Build it out of out of paperwork or build it out of Lego or something. So start to evolve your idea from you know a wonderful thought, a bit more abstract in terms of a of a non-tech prototype and then to, to, to gradually refine it and move it then towards a technical platform. Um, what, what I'm trying to say is that you know you don't don't rush to to a technical prototype too quickly. Think it through. Think it through and, and abstract it in other ways and then uh, apply it to the technology. And then one final point I would say is that you know as you move through those phases, don't look for perfection too quickly. Hungry, too expensive for what you want to do ultimately, just get something that works and then con continually refine it to make it uh, better and better as you can. All right, thank you, Brian. That, that's a, a great kind of initial framework of, of how to, to move through the, the phases of of developing a new prototype. Um, Fatamata, having kind of gone through, a, a, well, being in the process of going through this uh, uh, series of steps, do you want to give us some insights about uh, moving a, a technology through the, the prototyping and into a uh, more complete idea? Yeah, so uh, when I started to think about the project uh, Quintideco, I had so many ideas on how I was I was going to do, but two months ago I went to Mali to start the implementation of the project, and then with uh, will facts, I mean the facts to be here with the people, so I realized that I was going to work on several issues that I didn't ever even think about, such as the legal issues on how I can have, for example, a place to cultivate my plants, my fruits, etc. But also the women, because most of the women I will work with are alone and they must uh, earn money uh, right now. But with my fundings, I was, I was not able to pay uh, those women right now. 
So I had to think how I was going to do, et cetera, et cetera. But all the ideas I had at the beginning of the project, I, I keep all of them in mind, but I know that I will do my best to do it, even if it takes a long time. But for sure, uh, don't put any um, limitations on your project at the beginning. As someone say, I don't know who said that, but think, uh, think big. All right, and that, that's a, a really great kind of set of discussions about, you know, moving through uh, needing to, to understand, you know, the reality versus the kind of initial concept and then moving on to a bigger idea. Now, uh, and as you move a lot of people in uh, the port through the, the phases of moving from a prototype to a, a more developed technology, do you want to give us some insights that you've uh, picked up during your, your work with this? Yeah, sure. Um, I think I can only uh, second uh, Brian on Fatimata because uh, what we are doing at the port and also here at CERN is we are trying to think way ahead in terms of technology. So we are thinking of what would be hap uh, happening in the future. What can we do in 30 years time from now on? And uh, then we basically try to stay at the edge of technology and invent our future ourselves. And this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you just dream big enough and you stay at the uh, edge of technology, this will help you to to grow in the steps and uh, to get your ideas done. And that's a very important uh, bit of insight to, to keep in mind. Uh, unfortunately, I think we've lost Malala for the moment. Uh, I'm going to see what's, what's happened with her and how we can uh, get her back involved. Uh, but in the meantime, um, we do have a, a question from Adam. And uh, I have a feeling that this is going to be something that I may have to, to jump in with my own answer to. So Adam? Yes. So the project that uh, I am representing is a telecommunication project, but also on the verge of smart city, telemedicine, and social innovation. I am asking uh, what kind of uh, resources are there from uh, the ITU and Intel as a company for a startup like, like mine that I am with my team working on? So, uh, Brian, do you want to give a, a sense of what might be uh, available from Intel? Sure. Um, Adam, I think there are many things depending on what your need is, but, you know, Intel have, not necessarily through this competition, thinking more generally, Intel have a number of development type platforms that will allow people to put full of technical features that allow you to really understand the nature of your your prototype and ultimately what it, what what features and characteristics you want in an eventual product so we've a lot of what we would call development platforms available and um, that's at a hardware level at a software level we have many SDKs software development kits and they allow and we have training in those kits uh, online training and also hands-on training where we have various workshops that people can attend, and really the software, of course, is the is the is the controlling channel between the hardware and the person. So you need to have to be able to develop your prototype with a, a software layer, of course. So we have support at development level on a platform, hardware platform, and also at a software level through various software development kits that are available. Okay. Okay, um, and I can jump in uh, from the ITU side kind of generally, and then I think I'll actually uh, uh, pass off the, the question to, to Fatimata to give kind of the lived experience of, of one of the things that we do, which is obviously the Young Innovators Competition. Um, for those that, that do 
fit the, the criteria, you have to be between 18 and 30, um, and you have to be working on a social uh, uh, entrepreneurship project, which both of which are the case for you. Um, there's the Young Innovators Competition, which I talked about a little bit before, but uh, the, the biggest thing uh, that we're able to do is connect young insights and share their, their resources with uh, the young people that we work with. Um, <clears throat> oh, am I muted still? I don't know what's going on with my sound, but I keep having issues. But uh, am I better? Okay. So um, the the Young Innovators Competition is clearly one of the big things that the ITU does to support uh, social entrepreneurship, especially among young people. So we have our platform, and uh, we look for uh, young people who have ideas in particular areas of development. And we're able to give them kind of the, the access to this range of mentors and experts that are available through the ITU World event. Um, we also have uh, uh, our idea exchange program, which is intended to connect those young people who either um, don't have an idea that's specifically in the social space or one which is social but doesn't actually meet one of our challenges. And it gives them a space where they can kind of talk about their ideas and all of that. And then, of course, also through our Facebook page and the Young Innovators Academy program, we connect with uh, some added resources that we can give young people as far as kind of a, a, a general education and business and technology. Um, a number of uh, startups that focus this year. We're, we're actually refocusing our efforts specifically on startups and SMEs. And so we're, we're going to be creating a lot of uh, new projects related to entrepreneurship. So uh, keep an eye on, on what we'll be doing, especially some of the announcements that will be coming out of I2 Telecom World, because I think there's going to be a lot of resources that are, are going to be coming out of that that will be very interesting. Um, and otherwise, I mean, there, there's a lot of work that we do in terms of Girls in ICT Day, uh, which is intended to encourage women in the field of STEM and lets us highlight uh, a lot of the, the projects that are coming from women uh, around the world. Uh, and other activities like the Gem Tech Awards or the, the WISIS Awards that um, those particular areas, whether it's, it's for the Gem Tech uh, Women in STEM or uh, for the WISIS Awards, uh, develop, kind of development areas of technology. Um, and how uh, uh, people who have good entrepreneurial ideas can work with us on those areas. Um, and that, that's kind of the, the big picture view of the things that we do on a regular basis with uh, entrepreneurship. But as I said, we're, we're really kind of developing a lot of new exciting partnerships and activities at the moment. So uh, keep an eye on what happens around I do telecom world. Yeah. Screens back. Um, do you want to give us a sense? Of what kind of resources and, and help? Ah, okay. There you go. So you asked me to. Um, can you talk a bit about the what what we were able to do as far as the Young Innovators competition for you? Yeah. So. Um, 
The ITE competition was the first competition I won uh, about the project uh, Connected Eco, and it uh, gave me a lot of uh, credibility and also visibility to accelerate and to ask for more funding to do the project. And uh, I had the, the pleasure to have a lot of experts who gave me uh, a lot of advices and also the mentors that are here to help you to, to, to elaborate a good strategy to, um, to the success of your projects. But for sure, the ITU competition, it's like uh, they really gave me uh, also the, um, the feelings that my project was not uh, bad and that my project also was uh, feasible. So, yeah, I won a lot with IT competition, so many things, and with the fun funding that uh, ITU gave me, so uh, I had the opportunity to go to Mali and to start to buy uh, some um, some tools to start to uh, to do a project. So I bought some uh, computers, and now there's someone of my team in Mali who is uh, training the cooperative of women to to use the ICT uh, technologies. So this is yeah, and and actually is as part of the the Young Innovators competition. One of the things that we've seen that's kind of uh, a big advantage that that people coming out of our program get, in addition to the the seed funding and the, the mentorship that that uh, we'd mentioned um, already, and and that Fatamata bring up bring brought up. Um, there's a level of support and a that kind of UN stamp that we call it, where to to get that uh, stamp of approval and stamp of support from a UN organization is often very powerful for young people who uh, uh, one of the big barriers that they have and one of the big challenges they have is to have a, a, a people take a serious look at their work. Um, so, Inez? Do you want to um, share some of the support? You're, you're not ITU or Intel, but some um, uh, Okay. Can, can you share a little bit about um, what you're able to do to get people involved in social entrepreneurship and, and uh, technology for humanitarian issues and so on? So what we are currently doing with the port is as we have kind of limited resources, um, we from our side can just help you to get into the right teams and get you the kind of connections you might need to drive your project further forward. However, we are in a collaboration with, um, here in Geneva, it's called the Impact Hub, which is an initiative to basically a co-working space, also some kind of uh, seed um, incubators. And um, what we are doing with uh, very successful teams who would like to keep up the idea and to bring their ideas forward, we are connecting them to these people to drive, um, to drive the project forward to help with the first uh, seed funding and uh, crowdsourcing. Um, I think this is the moment uh, where we can just help you to to find the right people to talk to, um, as we currently do not have, unfortunately, the resources to do so. And the issue of those uh, uh, connections and resources, can you hear me? Ah, the issue of those connections and resources is always uh, a very important issue, and, and we kind of, I think everyone kind of highlighted a bit the, the how those can be very valuable. Um, 
So Malala, do you want to ask your second question uh, uh, about the um, scalability and, and access in uh, developing countries? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, this question um, might be geared more towards Brian, but um, I, I'd appreciate any sort of input. Um, this was uh, in reference to the technology that um, uh, Intel offers uh, the Intel Edison and Galileo or any other technology right now, single board. Um, I'm talking. I wonder how scalable this technology is in terms of its usability in third world countries, for example, Pakistan. Um, what what do you think about that? Brian? She she specifically asked about your opinion on this. So sure. uh, we'll start with sure, you. Sure, Joe. Malala and, and just to understand the question properly, um you put the question in the context of developing countries like Pakistan, you know, what, what kind of challenges do you think that are particular with respect to scaling on this type of platforms like Galileo and Edison? What, what types of things are you conscious of when you ask that question? Um, um, I, scalability in my, what I mean, what, what I'm worried about is um, probably the lack of technological infrastructure. So we um, we don't have a lot of um, say 3G or 4G internet yes. connectivity is something yeah. that's very new in Pakistan. Um, a smartphone accessibility is something that's actually increasing now, but I worry about the affordability. Say um, a fifty dollar um, chip, uh, a wearable made with a fifty dollar chip, would anybody? be interested in, would, would they be economically interested in buying something like that when a smartphone costs them about twice as much would have apps that could, you know, um, probably do half of the same job. Uh, so I'm thinking scalability in terms of economics and also in terms of uh, the infrastructure. Understood, understood, uh, Manala. It's, it's a really good question. Um, you know, unfortunately, the specifics of, you know, Pakistan, for instance, I'm not familiar with. But I would say, in general, one of the things, and I'm talking from a general point initially, one of the things about the technology sector is the incredible rapid pace of innovation, and we we operate. It's in our mission actually to a principle that was established by one of the founders of Intel, Gordon Moore. Over 40 years ago, and it's known in the in the in the in the business as Moore's law, and how we double the capability of technology every 18 months, and really a subtext to that is the capability and the affordability. And if you do any sort of analysis on technology compared to other vectors within our economy, technology has increased its capability and reduced its cost phenomenally um, at a phenomenally high rate. Um, it's a general answer, I know, Malaw, and I, I'll get to some specifics in a second, but, but I think we trust technology to drive more capability at a lower cost all the time. And, you know, even at a PC level, as an example, we're, we look at PCs now that are around $500, that the type of technology would have cost you two or $3,000 only five or six years ago, similarly on smartphones and similarly on infrastructure. So I, I think the nature of our business drives towards cost effectiveness and that should make it more affordable and available to all. I think particularly about developing countries, you know, there is that principle too that uh, a legacy infrastructure is more of a hindrance than a help. So in other words, um, there's that if you have a developed country with so much legacy infrastructure, it actually is more costly to to get to the 5G and the, the, the new technology. So if, if the governments in these development countries are brave enough to invest in technology, I think they can actually invest in state of the art and make themselves competitively, very, very competitive, nearly a competitive advantage if, if um, that's, that's possible in the countries. And of course, it's case by case and everything comes down to priority calls for government. But in summary, Malawi, I'd say number one, trust technology to continue its affordability and efficiency uh, innovation path. And number two, I think developing countries have an opportunity to go to state of the art rather than deal with, with legacy systems that have been there for quite some time.
And that's, uh, uh, I mean, that, that the development of technology and the development of infrastructure is something that, that we're always very interested in. It's great to hear kind of uh, your insights about how that will help to, as we put it, to bridge the digital divide. Um, now, uh, and as you you run into a lot of issues uh, with the teams at the port in terms of what's going to be feasible uh, for you. I mean, it's a humanitarian context, so you're talking about you know in a lot of cases field situations. But uh, uh, certainly, deploying these kinds of technologies into developing countries is a big issue for you. Um, do you have any thoughts about uh, this the scalability of technology into developing communities? So what we are doing with the port and the teams that are working on our topics is we expose them to field experts as much as possible. So uh, for example, we have um, also a topic on um, bridging the technology gender gap for certain countries. We are, I guess, picking the Middle East uh, as an example. Um, and there we are trying also to connect to local people, women especially, um, to understand why there are these issues and uh, what they would wish as a kind of solution. So it's more listening than a and asking questions than talking. And I guess this is um, what we learned from past projects, that it really helps to ask questions to field experts, but also listening to the needs um, on the ground, what would be needed and in which kind of uh, size and scale. And I guess this is really key to really develop a product that will be used afterwards. And uh, yeah, that, that's a tremendous thing to adapt to uh, the local uh, economy and ecosystem and what's feasible on the ground and so on. Uh, Fatimata, do you have thoughts about that, uh, uh, having done the, the, um, the transition to, to deploying your project recently? Well, uh, concerning my project for now, so um, in fact, um, I'm based in France. So in France, I'm working on the technology, on the sensors. But for now, I cannot uh, send them to Mali. And while I'm still working on the development of the sensors, in Mali, they're working with uh, computers. And the women are, um, um, are having lectures on how to use the computer. So I had really to... Um, to extend the uh, implant, I mean the pilot. Excuse me. I had to extend the pilot phase of my project to due to due to the conditions we are facing in Mali. So, for example, I wanted to send these uh, some sensors a uh, few weeks ago, but due to the political issues we are facing there, I cannot uh, send them. So, I cannot really share with you for now my point of view on the technology I'm using for my project. We, uh, uh, we, we're actually experiencing some, some uh, technological feasibility questions uh, uh, myself right now here in Geneva, so I can imagine it being a problem uh, around the world. Um, the, 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 I mean, the political situation and, and discussions like that are also, I mean, I think tremendously important to kind of how, how can you deploy these technologies and how can you get them out into the field, uh, it, especially when you need to consider situations like uh, uh, what's going on in Mali and, and so on. So um, I think that, that that, though you had said that it didn't, it didn't let you give the kind of insight into the question that, that we had hoped for, I think it, it is a very interesting point to be made. You know, how do you get the, those things even out to the field in the first place in a lot of cases? Um, so, were there any other questions uh, before we go to the wrapping up? If you have another question that you wanted to ask before we go.
Adam, did you have another question you wanted to ask before we go? Yes, yes. Uh, just uh, very short questions. Uh, uh, what are the main problems while cooperation with uh, young startups? Is it mainly a poor ideas? Is it the great ideas but poor quality of execution or uh, lack of interoperability of teams? What are the main issues that you are facing while uh, cooperation while working with startups? Um, all right. Uh, I suppose I'll, I'll share my insights first and then we can kind of uh, uh, give some, some feedback to people. Uh, give some, some space for the rest of our, our participants to feedback on this. Um, I think we do definitely run into a lot of ideas that are very early phase and, and in some cases kind of are more driven by excitement than uh, being well thought out. And we run into that from time to time. Though I think uh, for this and for a lot of the, the questions that we're running into, they're not necessarily problem specific to young entrepreneurs. Their problems for the the ideas may not scale as well as they're hoped to scale, or that um, they they kind of run out of steam, or they don't find their market. These are problems that are are universal. That I think can be particularly intense for young entrepreneurs because they're not necessarily coming in with the business experience, with the tech experience that uh, uh, more older entrepreneurs would be coming in with. Um, another big problem that we run into, and this is something that uh, uh, that UN stamp that I mentioned before is uh, very powerful in, in fighting against, uh, is the fact that in some cases you get uh, either established programs like incubators or things like that or uh, investors who look at someone between the age of 18 and 30 and go, you're, you're a kid. How can we possibly back your startup? How can we possibly back what you're trying to do? Um, and that's a, a really unfortunate situation, but um, because we're able to say like, you know, a UN organization has said this is uh, an exciting project that has potential, that can uh, help to mitigate that problem. Um, now, I, I guess I'll, I'll open up the... Fatamata, do you have any thoughts about uh, being a young entrepreneur? Do you, do you have any issues that you've run into that are particular for yourself? Uh, when I went to Mali and I met several people to talk about my project, you know, they, they were looking at me like, you're young, you're a lady, so what are you looking for? But when I show them that I won the IT competition, you know, things change and they helped me a lot. So I think that uh, really the uh, competition gave me the credibility that I, I won't uh, earn by my work, unfortunately. So this is my thought as a young entrepreneur and especially as a young lady, young, 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 young woman who wants to work in the technology. I mean, it was too many difficulties and I really need the help of someone to, <laughs> to I mean, someone like ITU or even uh, the Malian government to help me to implement my project, so, yeah. And, and um, I think uh, uh, knowing a bit about your background, probably a bit more than, than a lot of our listeners and, and uh, our participants, um, that, that more credibility than you've earned, I, I, that's not the way that I'd word it. I would say more credibility than people are willing to give you because you, you're already uh, uh, at your young age, you already have uh, a 
successful work as an astrophysicist, if I am not mistaken, and um, your eyes toward Internet of Things. Uh, it's a problem more of the way people perceive youth than uh, what youth actually means. You know, uh, uh, so. Um, and, and so on. Uh, Brian, do you have thoughts about working with young entrepreneurs? I, I think um, m m many different challenges. I know, I know that's not the answer you want to hear, but one of the things that more generally for entrepreneurs, not alone young entrepreneurs, we talked earlier about getting an idea to prototype, but, but a really key milestone is getting a first customer. And, and that, that's so important as a verification of your concept, as a productionization of your concept, and, and ultimately that somebody values it enough to pay for it. And uh, drive, and, and then of course you get feedback from a customer, and it's it's a iterative process at that stage. But that that challenge and ultimately that milestone of hitting a first customer, I, I think, is uh, incredibly it's a challenge, and it's incredibly important in a, in an early stage of a of an idea and an entrepreneur. That's uh, uh, something that that's something that uh, with the ITU work with SMEs and, and small businesses that we're we're beginning to talk about a lot in terms of I have a good idea and how do I take it from being a good idea and how do I move it to a space where it's a, a commercially strong. Um, concept and a business that's going to be self-sustaining. Um, and that's questions of investment potential, um, that's questions of first customers, uh, that's questions of, of the kind of uh, uh, use case and, and uh, demonstrating the viability of the idea and so on. So um, I mean the, the range of challenges I think um, there are a few that affect young people more in terms of getting people to take you credibly and uh, finding a team that's going to have the experience that you need. But uh, I, I think for the most part there's a, a, a strong comparison with entrepreneurs across the board. And uh, the, the first customer uh, where out of time, so uh, we'll have to leave the questions off there. Um, thank you to everyone for, for joining the call and, and getting involved. Um, Really, uh, issues around what they want to discuss. Okay, so um, Brian, I'm just going to invite you quick to talk about uh, what the, the Intel partnership with the Young Innovators Competition looks like. And, and before I give kind of our closing plug to, to get involved with the Young Innovators Competition, I, I'd like to, to have you talk about what the, the, in, the Intel is uh, doing for, for us and for our winners. Yeah, th thanks, Joe. And um, you know, the, the the basis of our involvement in this particular program is around the single board competition, our Galileo board and Edison board. And you know, I'm still thinking about Malala's question, which is really good about scale and opportunity in developing countries. Um, and I think one of the things about compute 
is that in, in many ways it's a leveler and it's becoming more affordable and I think the IOT space is a space where it has a low barrier of entry and the Galileo board and the Edison board are oh, they're they're quite quite affordable I know affordable means different things in, in different places but you know the whole explosion of IOT the availability of pervasive compute um, affordable compute the connectivity of the internet we're all connected to the internet here you know it's such an opportunity for people from all over the world to um, build their ideas and connect and create value and really you know fill their potential as innovators so look at we, we, we just we're just so happy to be involved in that context we're delighted to have the, the two boards the Galileo the Edison board for the competition and uh, you know we look forward to see all the entries and to ultimately work with the winners very closely okay um, so we were really excited when Intel came forward and they were interested in getting involved um, so for for those of you who are interested and would like to apply uh, over on ideas.itu.int which is our uh, open crowd uh, crowd community that uh, we use for the application process you can find the single board challenge it'll be open for about another two weeks up until the 8th of September uh, and we'll be happy to take your ideas on how you can use single board technology to develop wearables or IoT devices or any other kind of uh, connected technology that's going to make uh, the world a better place and, and have a social good type function. Um, and uh, for those of you who, who apply and win, you'll be joining us, uh, as I mentioned before, at ITU Telecom World in Budapest, Hungary this year uh, from the 12th to the 15th of October for uh, a chance to uh, have some mentoring and, and uh, workshop classes with top-level international experts on the these topics and uh, get some business uh, skills and, and development on that side and then also the chance to pitch in front of our audience of business leaders, public sector, private sector, um, investors and academics and, and uh, the chance to, to network with all of them over the course of this so we have this development year following on uh, where you, you stay in touch with our mentors and, and get the visibility that ITU is able to provide and some of that uh, additional networking that we can do for, for young people that we work with. So um, from the, myself and our, uh, the team here at ITU Telecom World, I'm very happy that all of you could join us today and, and uh, thank you very much and uh, hopefully we'll be seeing you in Budapest. Thank you, thank you Joe. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Thank you.